This week on TechNATO, we actually have three great interviews. We're going to be talking about diversity in tech. We're also going to be looking at a threat intelligence gateway. We're going to be talking about an app that could be stealing your data. That's all coming up on TechNATO, starting right now. Hello and welcome to TechNATO. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and joined as always by Don Pazet and Justin. I know. Why, why do we even say this person's going to be on our show full time and then, uh, yeah, uh, I can't be here? <laughs> yeah, Justin, uh, I don't know, took vacation. I, I don't know what he's doing. He's up in Virginia in the mountains. Yeah. Shooting squirrels. Hanging whatever trail it was you guys were talking about. Appalachian the other day. Trail. How do you not know the Appalachian Trail? Like, why would I go walking through the woods? That's crazy talk. That's fair. Fair point. Uh, well, we have a big show today. Uh, we we kicked out Justin for this week, but we also uh, we actually have three interviews. Uh, Justin was here for one of them, right? I think. Yeah, Probably. he was here for the uh, yeah for the one with uh, Perdeo, which we're going to talk about uh, a malicious um, uh, Android app that uh, could be stealing your data. Uh, we're going to talk with uh, Bandora Cyber, and we're also going to talk uh, with. The uh, executive vice president of the Fort Knox Gold Chapter, Gold Vault Chapter of AFCIA, Catherine Thompson. So that's all coming up. But first, we have some news to get to. So let's take a look at our first story, which is over on Forbes.com. Microsoft confirms change to Windows 10 passwords that nobody saw coming. And so I know that that Microsoft's been saying for the longest time that we don't need passwords anymore, and and your and passwords are a thing of the past. Is 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 that what they changed here? No, so passwords are still a very real thing. They okay. still exist. Uh, there has been a huge push for everybody to go to multi-factor. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've run any of the newer Windows 10 versions, you know that it's constantly pushing at you to implement Windows Hello. So logging in with a PIN number or a facial ID or fingerprint or any combination of those things and maybe even a password, that's all part of the system. What they've changed is the password expiration date. For years and years, I mean, since really NT Server came out, they have been pushing the idea of a password that resets every 30 to 90 days, right? A lot of times they would default to 42 days. I don't actually know where that came from, but that was kind of what they picked. Uh, most companies, though, will usually choose 60 days, 90 days, maybe six months. Isn't saying, that the secret of the, the universe or something from Hitchhiker's Guide? Uh, it is the answer to life, the universe. To life, yeah, yeah, that's probably where 42 came from. Maybe. It seems odd for password reset policy, but I've seen things some, based on weird things. Some nerd made that choice. <laughs> so, so for years, though, they've told us, hey, it's a good idea for employees to change their passwords on a regular basis. Now, Microsoft is acknowledging what security researchers have acknowledged for years and years, that changing your password doesn't actually help all that much. It just makes people more likely to forget their password, which makes them more likely to write it down somewhere where it can be compromised. Also, people didn't like changing it anyway, so they would just say, all right, I'm going to use password one, and then password two, password three, right? You know, just adding and then you a number. You can't use any of your last two. So you, after three, you can go back, or four, you can go back to it's one. It's a again. constant battle. And yeah. so, uh, so those those password policies, they're still there. You can absolutely still implement all of them if you want to keep your business the same way. But it's no longer the default. So if you install Windows uh, and set that up, it will not default to having a password expiration policy coming in the next version, the, the version that's being released. Uh, I believe it's the. Well, you know, I'm going to say it's being released, 1903, which should already be out at this point, but who knows. Uh, Microsoft's been on a weird release cadence on this stuff. But basically, most people just expected Microsoft to stick with it and then eventually phase out the password. But here's a change. Kind of interesting to see. Now, the image on this Forbes article, is that what the password screen looks like, or is that <laughs> Oh, absolutely. That <laughs> and uh, and it definitely works on a Mac, uh, which is what's oh, shown yeah. in the picture, too. Because that's... Yeah, it just says, password. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's almost screen. like our level of journalism right there. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, let me just go to Shutterstock, search password, done. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, uh, we've got another great piece of, of Microsoft news this week. We're kind of uh, we're we're going light on the news because uh, we got a lot of interviews to get to, but. Um, uh, this this was one of those wacky stories. Uh, My that, favorite that article of the week. Done, and and you know what? I've been on this website so many times, but is it Kotaku? That's how I've always said it. Kotaku. Kotaku.com. It's wrong. part of the, the Deadspin, uh, Jezebel, Gawker family that became <laughs> National Enquirer that I think just got sold again, I heard, um, hey. to somebody else. So good for them. If you can't trust them, who can you trust? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so this one is Microsoft's official examples of, quote, acceptable trash talk 
are a joy. And so, uh, you know, Microsoft is trying to combat what is um, something that's definitely an issue uh, on, on online gaming communities of, um, you know, racism, sexism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, all of the things that are uh, are said in, in not just like written chat, but, uh, you know, spoken to between 10-year-olds and uh, and 40-year-olds in their basements. Uh, all those things are, are going on. And Microsoft knows that's happening and is trying to combat it. But what's great about this article is they actually list the not-to-say things, <laughs> Examples. not just the things to yeah. say. So what, what's your favorite here? Uh, you know, honestly, my favorite one, and it, none of these are ever things that I would ever say. And I, while I do behave myself on the podcast, I certainly behave myself at work. Uh, when I'm out with my friends, I've known to say not nice things on occasion. Uh, but these are just so off the wall. I, mean, I guess maybe it's kids these days, but my favorite is the one that's... Uh, Cheap win, totally expected from a insert racial slur here. <laughs> <laughs> now they they uh, suggest that instead you say cheap win. Come at me when you can actually drive without running ca- cars off the road. So I assume that's about a racing game and not just a different racial slur. There, that, that, but yeah, is that a racial slur? <laughs> oh, ra- okay. And, and what if it's there. a game like Carmageddon where you're supposed to run the cars off the road? Exactly. This yeah. doesn't apply. Now I got to yeah. interpret it. Grand and Theft Auto. Before you know it, racial slurs right back in. Uh, <laughs> but it's just the way they've written. Hey, profanity! Yeah. That was some serious potato aim. Get wrecked, trash. They suggest just saying that was some serious potato aim. Get wrecked. Yeah. yeah. That take even yeah. take out the trash. Do people say get wrecked. That's oh, all the time. Us kids. Mm, well, sorry. All I, right, think I'm, I think I'm like two years younger than you. I gotta uh, practice my uh, get insert sexual threat here. Uh, that's uh, another good one. So yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, kids need to watch their mouth these days. This article is absolutely not going to help in any single way whatsoever. Nope. But uh, hey. all it's going to do is suggest things to kids <laughs> that they hadn't thought of yet. <laughs> oh, I forgot about going after their sexual orientation or their uh, country of origin. Or yeah, yeah I so. don't know what KYS stands for, but I'm going to say it now. I'm going to start saying it must be bad. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, speaking of Russian trolls. Um, <laughs> I guess they're starting their own uh, Xbox Live because, uh, according to Engadget, Putin signs Russian internet isolation bill into law. And so, this is something we talked about uh, a few weeks ago that they were discussing or, or testing. So, right. if if there was a, um, you know, if cables were cut, uh, would they go down? Because you were saying the issue is that. They're, they don't control their own DNS system, right? Right. The The main issue with any country, there's not just Russia, really, if any country wants to operate completely independent, you know, if, if other countries shut them off, DNS, right? You have the 13 key root hint servers, or at least those names, those aliases that point to 13 different clusters. So it's a ton of different servers. Uh, but those are mostly controlled by the United States, the U.S. government. So if somebody like like Russia shut off their boundaries and just said, that's it, we're going to we're going to wrap up our country, they would then effectively break DNS, which is pretty important. So they ran a test a few weeks ago to see, you know, could they stand up their own root hint servers and then operate that way? Uh, Their test was successful. They were able to do that, which, you know, it's not that hard. Uh, But now they're going a step further and they're saying we shouldn't have to stand up something after we get cut off, we want to be independent even before that. And so now they are building their own infrastructure. So they, they've got, uh, where it's signed into law now, they're making that effort, uh, and they will now have it where they're not beholden to any other country. They, they, have, they can't be shut off for accessing resources within their own country. And, you know, normally we report on these things, and here in the U.S. especially, we have a little bit of propaganda to make it sound like, oh, you know, Russia's the bad guy. But in this case, honestly, I think every country should be doing this. Every country should be able to protect their own internet resources, and so I don't, I, I certainly don't begrudge them this. That said, though, this could be, you know, a move towards censorship and uh, like a North Korea or, or you know, the Great Wall, the Firewall in, in China kind of thing, yeah, right? it certainly could. And, you know, it, using the Great Firewall China, that's a, an example there where they're not just setting up a boundary where everything has to pass through the government. They're also f- extensively filtering and blocking that traffic. So the uh, the Russian law, well, they've already got laws that say they're allowed to filter and, and all that. So it very well could end up the same way. Uh, but if we didn't put that piece in, right, just the idea of a country wanting to guarantee their Internet access, sure. I think— it, you know, here in the U.S., we already have that because, well, because we kind of control those. <laughs> we those invented the internet. Al uh, Gore yeah, and yeah, we got Al Gore. Um, now, so uh, my my question is, if they're having their own completely separate DNS setup, I mean, in theory, could there be an Amazon.com that if that that you can register in Russia then, and if you went to that one, 
it brings you to that separate in, site? In theory. But what's going to happen is basically they're going to stand up their own root hints. And when you run a, a search against them for Amazon.com, right, the root hint server is going to say, all right, here's the server in charge of .com. And it's going to point to the real mm -hmm. servers that are in charge of .com. So that's going to exit Russia. But if it's unreachable, if that, that boundary's been severed and they're now isolated, they'll have their own .com server already there, and the, the hint servers will just point to it. And they likely won't want to have replicated all of the stuff from the other countries because they're now isolated. They wouldn't be able to get to it. So uh, I doubt they would start taking registrations, although they could easily masquerade, hijack, whatever. It, it, it would be, they would control at that point and do whatever they want. Well, Russia's always been responsible with their internet use, so I think uh, yeah, nothing to worry about there. Uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, Russia uh, and internet use, uh, this next article from the thetechnologyreview.com, West Virginia will allow blockchain voting in the 2020 election. That is a risky idea. So is this easier or harder now for Russia to uh, to access the voting? Uh, you know, it, it depends on what they're trying to do. So if it's to basically send in false votes, it's easier. As far as accessing the voting, they didn't really disclose how that would be accessed. That's so uh, they would certainly be able to, and when I say they, I really mean anybody. Like with blockchain, blockchain is not really about secrecy. Uh, blockchain is about... Uh, immutability, right? Proving that something can't be changed once it's entered in. And what West Virginia is doing is they're saying, look, we have a lot of people that are out of the country, out of town, out of state, whatever, when it's time to vote. So they need to do absentee ballots. But the challenge there is we have to mail a ballot to them. So they usually have to request it. It gets mailed to them. They fill it out. They mail it back. Well, a lot of people don't like to request it or forget to request it. Then you got to wait for it to get mailed. You got to wait for it to mail back. There's just, there's too many points where people don't or they just get lost in the process I and they feel don't like vote. Those votes are never counted either. They're all they always say, Oh, and there's, you know, ten thousand uh, absentee Still ballots that, that will get it. It it's mattered in Florida. A few it's times. mattered. It's definitely mattered. So with this, the idea is those people can just go online and they can vote and there'll be a blockchain record that shows how they voted that ensures they only vote once and, and all of that. So, you know, it, it sounds great, like great idea. Numerous security researchers have come out and said, look. Electronic voting of any kind is a bad idea. It's just not – people aren't putting forth the effort. Uh, but West Virginia is being a little progressive, and they're going to try it out. So we'll see what happens. Uh, sometimes, uh, I'll tell you, security researchers can paint a little picture of the sky as falling, and maybe it isn't. Maybe it'll all turn out great, but we know the population of West Virginia – and if the 2020 election registers votes that are 10 times the population, then you'll know it didn't work. <laughs> or, or if the state goes blue, we'll, we'll say something obviously went wrong in, in West Virginia. Yeah, they are a – well, wait, are they a Well, I don't know. State? It's tough because it's a union state as well, but it's, yeah. it's coal and I don't, I don't know. I don't uh, know. Well, we're not, we're not going to put them in a bucket. Now we got to find out. The people of West Virginia have their own minds <laughs> and, uh, and can vote however they want, so – or Good if luck. not, the Russians will help. Yeah, the Russians will help <laughs> vote for you. They, they're like, we don't have to influence your vote, so we can just make them for you now. So it's a lot easier. And, you know, we always say that, like, oh, the Russians will help. But honestly, uh, if you're doing remote voting like that, any country can help. Sure. Yeah, North Korea, <laughs> feel free to get involved. China, everyone. Yeah. You're welcome to the party. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's move over now to Motherboard uh, on motherboard.vice.com. Hackers breached a programming tool used by big tech and stole private keys and tokens. It says Docker Hub lost keys and tokens for around 190,000 accounts, which could have which could have downstream effects if hackers used them to access source code at big companies. So uh, is this Docker itself being hacked then? Sort of, yeah. So, you know, you've got Docker, right, which uh, is a container system, so you can take applications that you write, drop them into a container, and it runs on top of a Linux kernel that's consistent. So you have a container environment on your own machine, and then when you deploy on a server, it's the same environment. The application runs the way you want it to, right? It's great. Well, as you build those containers, you'll usually use images. And those images have a small operating system that's part of it that's supposed to only contain the pieces that you need to make your application work. Well, a lot of times, we don't build our own images from scratch. We use somebody else's. So uh, companies like Red Hat, Microsoft, Canonical, they have containers built up for Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Ubuntu or Windows or whatever it is that we're trying to use. So we grab one of their official images to deploy. Well, Docker Hub is designed to be a centralized repository of those images. And so all the companies that I just named and more, like Oracle and, and others, 
have official images stored on Docker Hub that, that companies rely on every day to, to pull down these images and have the official container. Well, attackers got the private keys used for storing and securing a lot of those containers uh, for around 190,000 accounts. And what that means is that at least for a, a brief while, and I haven't actually seen the time frame yet, uh, but for at least a brief while, attackers were able to modify or republish images that contained whatever the heck they wanted, right? You know, they had the keys to be able to properly encrypt these things, to load them up, make them look official. And so if you pulled an official Red Hat image from Docker Hub, it could be loaded with malware or backdoors or, you know, uh, reverse shells. And you wouldn't see it because it would pass the test check and it just comes down. This is a huge, huge deal. And it hasn't been reported a lot uh, at various media outlets, which I'm, I'm pretty surprised. Uh, and maybe maybe that means that containers, or at least Docker, is more of a buzzword than an actual production-implemented uh, tool in a lot of places. But I think uh, I think this is this is kind of a, a worst case scenario for them. At least they detected it and have resolved it. Yeah, and so when we say re they've resolved it, they they've been able to identify which ones had had been accessed and roll them back in, in case there was an issue. Well, and, and even a rollback can't truly be trusted, so they're having to reset keys and re-sign all of the images that have been uploaded, uh, which you know they've been doing. There's there's obviously contingency plans for this stuff, but. In the time it took them to detect it, there was obviously a weakness. And you know, securing your private keys is kind of, uh, kind of the, the the most important aspect of what we're going to do in any business. So uh, you know, one security researcher, I, I love this quote. Uh, they said that it was, and I quote, "definitely really bad," uh, which I think might be our understatement yeah. of the year. But is that like DefCon two? Def yeah, <laughs> one. I don't know. Definitely, <laughs> definitely really bad. Definitely really bad. That's that's up there. Well, they should use blockchain. Yeah, 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 that would have solved all the problems. That would have fixed it. <laughs> all right, uh, we're going to go over now to krebsonsecurity.com, and uh, and it's Brian Krebs, right? Brian? Yes. Yeah, so he's a security uh, uh, journalist, uh, but annual protest raises $250,000 to cure Krebs. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I didn't know that, that Krebs was, was a disease, but apparently it is. So this is kind of a comical one. Uh, a couple of years ago, you know, Brian Krebs, he, he works with various researchers to undercover criminal elements that are out there on the Internet. Uh, there was a Bitcoin mining scheme where uh, malicious websites would embed a Bitcoin miner in the site. So you browse to the site and all of a sudden you'd be Bitcoin mining for them. Uh, that system was called CoinHive. And... Brian Krebs and the researchers he works with were able to trace that back to a German language forum. And they then proceeded to out the identities of a lot of people that were on that forum to be able to try and stop this coin hive thing from spreading. Well, the people in the forum were not too happy about that. Uh, so they decided to uh, stage a, a protest, an anti Krebs protest. Now, apparently, and I didn't know this, but in German, the word Krebs means cancer. And so they created a protest where you could donate money uh, and potentially raise money, which they would then turn around and give to a, uh, not cancer awareness, but a you know search for the cure type charity right there in Germany. Uh, and so last year they raised about $250,000. And then this year they're doing the whole thing again, and they've already raised $250,000 again to give to the cure cancer charity over there. But uh, it's kind of a, a tongue in cheek thing like, uh, they're mad at Brian Krebs, and they're turning that into a social initiative. Yeah, so who are the people donating then? The people that... Uh, criminals. Yeah, other it, it's criminals? Honestly, it, it's probably the, the CoinHive Bitcoin-generated funds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. here's, the, here's the money that, that I made by uh, uh, leveraging your system. So. Yeah. So, All right. But, you know, he, he's got a big write-up on it. it. It's an entertaining read, and uh, I, I, I don't think it makes any... It doesn't undo the damage that these people did, and they'll certainly still go to jail if they get caught. You know that that's all still a real thing, but at least there's some good coming out of it. Yeah, you can't be mad about that if the uh, if they're doing that and raised over half a million already in the last couple of years there for uh, cancer research. And uh, yeah, it looks like the uh, it says decidedly not suitable for work uh, German language website <laughs> uh, program dot com two m's and a zero instead of an o for program there so easy uh, to remember take a look at that at your own uh risk apparently <laughs> but uh but yeah head over donate tell tell krebs mm. how mad at you are at him yeah. and 
tell other yeah. cribs how mad you are at it. Go over there and donate. You know, share your financial yeah. information with. Just uh, put in your routing number, right? Yeah. Yeah. That you've also <laughs> donated two hundred fifty thousand dollars to them. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Actually, it looks like they're up to about two hundred eighty-four thousand, according to uh, the latest in the article. Euros. You know, do do they take into effect uh, VAT? We got to knock twenty percent off, right? Are you taxed on your donation? It's Europe. You're taxed on everything. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, but you can go to the doctor. All right. Anyway, we're not going to get into that today. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's head over for our last story here from Tom's Hardware. Razor Toaster is official. CEO reveals. And at first, I, I said the the scooter people are making a toaster. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. But uh, but this actually stems from an April Fool's joke from what 20, 2016. 2016 yeah, so, two years. Uh, you've been following this since then? Or? or three years ago now, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, a couple of years back, uh, Razor, if you're not familiar with them, they we don't usually do consumer reporting. They make video gamer stuff, right? So uh, gaming mice, gaming keyboards, which are all just, you know, regular mice and regular keyboards, but they make them look pretty. And uh, and so, you know, they, they sell a ton of this stuff. It's all very high high dollar. It's, it's not cheap. Uh, so they've specialized in making performance hardware. And it's an April Fool's joke. They said they were going to release a Razor toaster, so a, a, an actual bread toaster uh, that was branded with their stuff. Well, it was just a joke. It kind of went away, but they have pretty aggressive fans, people who really latched onto this idea. And month after month, people kept asking for the Razor toaster. And it bordered on harassment. Their CEO, uh, whose name is, was it Lynn? Oh, I'm going to mess up. Lynn Manuel name. Miranda? Uh, no. That doesn't sound right. No, that's the uh, guy from Hamilton. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, then it definitely Min, doesn't sound right. Min Liang Tan. Tan. There we go. Uh, that sounds right. I well, I mean, that. Except for the bad pronunciation. No, it doesn't sound right at all. So uh, anytime he would post on Twitter, People would immediately, or on Facebook, people would immediately respond with, you know, where's the Razor Toaster? We want it. And so finally they're coming out and, and they're doing it. And one of the big drivers to it was there's a, a whole Facebook group on getting this Razor Toaster made. And six different people posted that they got Razor, or is it 12? 12 different people posted that they got Razor Toaster tattoos. And so there's a picture of one right here on their site. Uh, the the code wow. name was Project Breadwinner, and so this person got the Razor Toaster tattooed on their arm, uh, which the the article makes a reference to the Zune guy. I don't know if you remember that Microsoft Zune. There was one guy who was so passionate about it, he got the Zune logo tattooed on his arm. Uh, let me just tell you, corporate logos are a generally bad thing to get tattooed mm -hmm. on. Uh, I was about to say on your body, but really anywhere yeah, uh, sure. on other people's bodies. Yeah, whatever. other people's bodies especially. But yeah, so people are uh, feverish about this, and they are actually releasing a Razor Toaster. Uh, it's official. They're manufacturing it. They have not announced a release date or a price. So uh, you know, be on the lookout. Well, if people are this rabid about it, I I say, you know, charge big. Well, yeah, because they'll probably sell fifty of them. <laughs> but forty four thousand likes on this uh, Facebook page. They'll manufacture fifty. They better they'll commit. sell fifty, and they'll be like, "It's sold out in record time." That's, true. That's the uh, Apple approach. Yeah, this will be the <laughs> big uh, Black Friday thing this year, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, all right, so uh, I, I I mentioned we had a few interviews um, this week. More than so a few. More th more than a few. So uh, definitely want to let you know uh, about those and go ahead and get to those. Uh, first of all, let's go to one uh, all the way in France. Uh, Vivian Raoul from uh, Pradeo. He's the CTO over there, and there's someone that we talked to. Um, I think it was RSA a couple of years ago. Was that you interviewed them or? Daniel? I'm not. Yeah, so we actually uh, have interviewed them a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, one time at RSA, but the other time was uh, via another interview after yeah. they had uh, detected an app that was doing some crazy stuff. And so they've detected another one, and fortunately we were able to get Vivian back on the uh, the Skype call and learn about it. Yeah, we're going to hear about a uh, an Android app that uh, that you might even have installed on uh, on your device. So let's go ahead and take a look at that interview uh, from Perdale right after this on TechNATO. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. IT directors often hoard so much knowledge that it's hard for their team members to learn. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide, this is important for me to learn. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. 
Welcome back to TechNado, and as promised, we are joined now by an old friend all the way from France. We have Vivian Raoul from Pradeo on the line again. How are you doing, Vivian? Hello, I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. And we actually, uh, we talked to you, uh, I think it was October 2017, we went back and looked uh, here on TechNado. So, um, but for those that maybe didn't see that episode, uh, before we kind of get into the, the meat of this, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, who Pradeo is and, and what you guys offer? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Pradeo, we are um, a security editor for um, mobile security uh, in general. So we provide uh, solutions to our customers to uh, protect their devices against uh, threats uh, coming from uh, the network, uh, coming from uh, the, the OS, uh, and especially coming from the, uh, the mobile apps. Uh, so we provide a, a range of solutions to, uh, to protect our customers against uh, these uh, this threats. Yeah, and one of the reasons we wanted to to check in with you is um, we heard you guys found out about uh, an, an app, a, a photo sharing app that was doing some weird things in how they were uh, storing customers' data. So can, can you uh, give us a little bit of background on that? Uh, yes, so we found out uh, some uh, curious information about uh, an application uh, whose name is uh, Appeal Smart Remote, uh, which is actually uh, an app uh, that can uh propose uh, uh that can be a remote for uh, different uh, devices uh, for uh, tvs uh, for different uh, uh devices and we found out that uh, this application was able to uh, access the external storage uh, and not only access uh, this area but also uh retrieve uh, some information uh especially your, your pictures uh to send them uh, to a remote server that do not belong to uh, to the editor yeah, and, and I know this was uh, pretty important for me because I, I was doing some reading. Uh, just, you know, a number of things have been coming out of Google recently about trying to control that access to external storage. And they, they had proposed some API changes to restrict what apps could do. And, and they just announced a couple of days ago they're going to push off those changes for another version of Android. So, so this, this kind of weakness where an app can access way more data than it should isn't going away anytime soon. But this one was exacerbated because it – not only did it have access to a lot of storage, but it was taking those photos and storing them on a server they didn't control, or at least the, the article that I read had, had indicated that. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Like, what what was that other server? Was it some kind of third party service? Yes, it was a, a, a third party server. So actually, we didn't investigate a lot more uh, on what uh, this this server was. Uh, the thing is, is that it, it's a, a uh, remote uh, app, so it, it is not supposed to uh, access your your pictures. Uh, it's not uh, something uh, that is claimed by uh, the editor or described uh, in the uh, uh, in the app's uh, description, uh, and it's not something it is supposed to do. So, of course, if you have a, a backup application, uh, I mean, it's uh, legitimate that it accesses your data and and send them. Uh, of your your device, but in this case, it, it was something uh, a bit more uh, suspicious, uh, and it, it's confirmed by the, the fact that uh, this behavior uh, disappeared uh, in the next version uh, of the uh, of the application. And and to um, to elaborate a bit more uh, on the uh, the permissions uh, system, uh, it's right that uh, Google reinforces the way. Uh, the permissions are asked to the to the user to make them uh, more interactive and to limit uh, privileges of the the applications. Uh, but it's always difficult to know what an application will actually do uh, from these uh, permissions uh, between a simple local reading and uh, uh, exfiltration of uh, of data. Now you're involved with this every day, so I, I'm curious what your opinion is. Uh, the when somebody installs an app, and just think like not necessarily a, a tech, just a, a regular user, they install an app and it gives them a prompt and it says, hey, this app is requesting access to your text messages or access to your storage. Do you find that people take those messages seriously or are people just hitting OK to get into the app as fast as they can? No, 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 absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I don't know anyone that actually reads uh, the permission uh, and uh, the fact that it becomes more interactive uh, is simply boring for users. Uh, they, they simply uh, accept it and uh, they 
uh, don't really look at what the app is actually doing. And in most of cases, they cannot really know what the app will uh, will do with uh, with these permissions. Yep. So in this case, you know, the app, uh, it, you know, it, it was requesting permissions. People were basically granting it the permission to do whatever it wanted. It was doing things that weren't in its documentation. You guys discovered that. You found the access this app was doing. And did you reach out to that developer specifically to to kind of report it and uh, and see if they would fix it? Uh, did, did you get any feedback from them? Uh, we did not in this case. Uh, that's something we we do uh, in some other cases. Uh, the the reactions from editors are, are various. Uh, some of them are not even aware uh, of the the behaviors of their own app uh, because. It, it often comes from uh, external and third-party libraries uh, that they add into their, their applications. Uh, and some of them simply uh, do not reply or uh, even sometimes just remove the behavior and we have, <laughs> we, we have uh, no, no, no specific news. In this case, we didn't contact uh, the, the editor. All right, so in this scenario, you, know, you had an app that you, you, you recognized that it was capable of, of accessing a lot more information. Were you able to actually see it gathering data that it wasn't supposed to? Like, were you able to see it transmit images somewhere else? Or, or is this more of a, you saw the capability of it? Oh, no. Uh, what we what we do, our, uh, our technology allows to uh, know what the app is actually uh, doing. So not what it has the right to do. Uh, because basically, from the permissions, uh, you can cross information and uh, uh, speculate about what the, the app could do. Uh, on your device, uh, like if you have uh, has the, the right to access your uh, your contacts and the right to access the internet, then it has the uh, necessary privileges to uh, uh, to leak your data off the device. But what we do is that we detect if uh, it actually occurs uh, or not. So in this case, yes, uh, it's uh, it's a fact. Now, I, I was looking through the blog post. Uh, kind of the the worrisome thing is not only the pictures, but it, it seems that on the bottom. And correct me if I'm wrong. There was other information being collected, like age, gender, income, marital status, political affiliations. Were those also being sent to that same server? Or they're just kind of yes. going outward. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. It, it was so cheap. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that. Uh, I can't think. I, why I don't, I don't even know would, yeah. why you would need to do. Yeah. I'm kind of flabbergasted that gathering pictures as well as all of that other information. Wait, where does that information come from? Because I like with pictures, I, I get it. You know, they're, they're stored on the external storage or on the phone storage so an app could see that. But like political affiliation, where where would an app access that data from? Oh, it could be done uh, from uh, ads uh, that are in the, uh, in the application and uh, uh, some forms that you are sometimes uh, create to, to fill or uh, you know, before to display uh, some uh, some page, uh, you have to uh, to answer a quick question. Uh, maybe you have a limited choice, but that's information uh, which is then stored within the application, and that is is retrieved uh, to profile you and uh, uh, generally to uh, to display uh, more targeted uh, targeted ads. Uh, that's uh, generally the the purpose of uh, this kind of uh, of behaviors. Oh, you know, you mentioned uh, third-party libraries. So I guess if that was an ad framework, or if it was tapped into Facebook for authentication, or something like that, you'd be able to pull information from there. Uh, now, yeah, it's oh. something that often uh, happens. Yeah. Now I know you mentioned that they they updated the app and they removed uh, some of that functionality there. They just stopped it from transmitting data or whatever it is that they did. For the data that you know was transferred to an external server, do you have any way to tell, like, has that data been removed or is it still sitting out there on some other server? Is that data just gone? What What's kind of the, the story with that? Yeah, that's something we, we, we cannot know because it happens on the on the server side. Uh, so what we saw is that in the next version, the, this behavior uh, uh, simply disappeared from the from the reports. But what happens on the server side, we, we cannot tell. So I'm curious, uh, is, is this something that your, your company does uh, often where you, you kind of go into different apps and just, just look for things that, uh, that might be concerns for customers? Or is this something that's brought to you by, by your own customers to, to investigate? What, what's that process look like for you? Uh, so our, our product uh, allows to automatically scan the applications that uh, users uh, install on their devices. Uh, so basically... Uh, we have uh, an agent uh, that is deployed on our 
uh, client's devices that monitors for everything that occurs on the uh, on the device, uh, which uh, checks uh, if the uh, network on which you are connected is uh, uh, is safe, uh, which checks if your OS is vulnerable, and so on, and which checks all the apps uh, installed on devices. So we automatically uh, retrieve and scan all the apps uh, used by our customers. And uh, in this specific case, when we uh, we receive uh, some some alerts from our engine uh, regarding some uh, let's say strange activities from apps uh, that are not supposed to to do these kind of things. Uh, then we investigate a bit more uh, to provide more accurate information uh, on on this uh, on this application. So that's the the, the way we usually we work to uh, to 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 produce uh, some some materials on uh, on apps we we consider as being uh, uh, interesting for our audience. Yeah, and you know that that's all something that we we talked a little bit more about in our previous interview. But you know, like you said, Peter, for the people that didn't catch that one, uh, what Prodeo does is, is they 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 kind of meet a need that a lot of enterprises have. Where if we have to secure a desktop, a laptop, a server, that's all stuff we're prepared to do. But with everybody doing the bring your own device thing, where they they have their own tablet, their own phone, it's hard for us to control all those different platforms. So Prodeo it operates kind of like antivirus in a way that you know it sits on the phone it monitors that application it sits on the tablet it monitors that and reports back to you now uh, I know you're able to see that information I know you're able to, to recognize when apps are doing things that are inappropriate is is your service able to stop the inappropriate access or does it just report it and then you're able to take action from there how does how does that work uh, so there are diff different ways uh, to uh, to remediate uh, the first one is uh, by preventing the execution of an application. Uh, that's something uh, we can do on Android uh, solely. On, on iOS, we, we cannot intervene on that. Uh, but we can push notifications to ask the user to, to, remove, um, to remove the app. And then we are uh, integrated uh, with a, a range of uh, partners uh, providing uh, EMM or UEM uh, solutions. Uh, that are also present on the device and then that can uh, uh, enforce specific policies on uh, uncompliant devices. So, for instance, you could uh, prevent a user from accessing its corporate emails or corporate resources uh, if the device is uh, compromised, for instance, by an application. All right, for those of you just turning in, we are interviewing Vivian Raul, CTO of Prodeo, and we were just talking about some of the different mobile platforms that you secure. You mentioned Android and iOS. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, in this case, Peel Smart Remote, this was an Android app. Do you find yeah. that one platform is more trustworthy than another? Like, are you seeing more malicious actors under Android because of the extra freedom you get? Is is iOS more secure? What, what's your opinion? Well, generally speaking, uh, we see more uh, malicious applications uh, on Android. Uh, indeed, because it's easier to, to develop uh, such apps uh, and to, to deploy them. Uh, it's way more uh, easy and common uh, for an Android user to, uh, to install, uh, install side-loaded uh, applications uh, than it is on, on iOS. Uh, that said, uh, iOS malwares are uh, generally uh, more malicious than, than Androids uh, because they often uh, rely on uh, OS vulnerabilities uh, exploitation uh, they are harder to remove, uh, harder to to detect, and uh, generally uh, uh, more harmful for uh, for devices. Uh, due to uh, the the permission system and apps isolation, uh, it's less common uh, on iOS to have uh, leaky uh, apps uh, because generally. Uh, at the time the data is uh, accessed, uh, the system uh, queries the user from uh, for its uh, authorization to uh, to access the information. So it's a bit more limitative than on Android, uh, where once you have granted the app with a with a permission, uh, you don't know what uh, what happens in the in the background. Uh, yeah, so it's it's a bit different between both platforms. All right, I know between those two, that's probably 90% of the mobile market out there, but do you see a lot of activity on other platforms or do you just focus on Android and iOS? Uh, we focus on those two. Uh, I mean, we, we um, 
also have the capability of uh, analyzing uh, uh, Windows apps. Uh, by Windows apps, I mean apps from the, the Windows Store, not the legacy uh, the legacy apps, uh, uh, which is something uh, that is that is done by classical antivirus and so on. Uh, but uh, our market and our clients uh, are mostly users of Android and iOS devices, so that's the two eyes on which we, we focus. So, Raul, it looks like uh, the, the whole write-up about this uh, Peel Smart app is on your blog at blog.pradeo.com. Uh, is, is, is that the best, best place to go to kind of stay up to date on the latest things that, uh, that you guys are discovering? Uh, sure. Uh, what we think is the, the most uh, interesting uh, ends up there. Uh, and of course, for our clients, th this kind of information actually can be found for every app uh, they have. Uh, every app installed on their devices will uh, be associated to uh, a security report which details what the app is doing. Uh, and they can automatically uh, uh, define rules uh, that will uh, allow or not uh, the, the execution of, uh, of apps. Uh, so basically what we have on, on the blog uh, is uh, an extrapolation of what we, we have in our uh, automated reports for the apps we, we find uh, the most uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, we love having you on and, and uh, I hope that uh, if there are uh, more things like this <laughs> that you discover, you know, it's always interesting to hear uh, you know, not just how you found this stuff, but how people are using our data out there. But uh, so hopefully we can have you on again uh, when you when you find the next uh, terrible thing <laughs> that's affecting our lives. Hopefully Sound a good? long time. For yeah. You. Yeah. My pleasure. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And thank you so much for all of you for watching. But stay tuned. We've got more Technado coming up right after this. I'm James Packer. I'm the general manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training. And last year alone, they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV, I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. All right, thanks to Vivian for joining us there and letting us know about that, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to be kept abreast of new um, mobile apps that are threatening our lives. Yeah, and you know we hear about this a lot. You, you just can't trust what applications do, and the the various vendors like like Google really aren't doing enough to make sure that we're protected on these things. And, and a lot of times we're not helping ourselves by just blindly approving permissions. So always keep an eye out on that, and we'll uh, we'll continue to keep our ear to the ground also as we hear other apps that are vulnerable. But that's not uh, our only interview for the show, right? No, we got more? Not. Yes, definitely. We, uh, we're we going to go over now back on to this side of the pond, and we're going to uh, head up to Kentucky uh, and talk with Catherine Thompson. Uh, she is the chapter vice president of women in FCA um, for the uh, chapter there at Fort Knox. And so we're going to find out a little bit about FCA, what they're up to there, some of their diversity programs. Um, we've, we've actually got an FCA event coming up um, that we're going to be attending that that's over in uh, Baltimore. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we're going to see how many gold puns uh, or references to being given gold that Don and I can mention uh, in, in this interview. So let's go ahead and take a look at that right here on Technado. Enjoying Technado? Then be sure to check out Ignite, another podcast from the Pro TV Network. Ignite highlights stories of leadership as host Vicky Guy interviews a new business person each week. Learn more at itpro.tv slash podcasts. Hello and welcome back to TechNATO. And as promised, now we have another great interview for you. We are joined by Catherine Thompson all the way from uh, shimmering golden Fort Knox uh, <laughs> up in Kentucky. Uh, how are you doing, Catherine? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. So uh, so you're involved with the FCA chapter up there. You're the executive vice president of the Gold Vault chapter, uh, and you're also the chapter vice president of Women in FCA. So we definitely want to talk about uh, about those roles. But first of all, for those that uh, aren't familiar with FCA, I, I know we've kind of been involved with it uh, at IT Pro TV for uh, a couple of years. We've gone to some of the shows and things, and Don and I actually had to look up uh, to remind ourselves what FCA actually stood for, <laughs> but it was uh, the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, what that organization is all about? 
So AFSIA uh, is an organization that bridges government and the military with information technology. So a lot of our programming that we do on Fort Knox, um, each chapter is different and Fort Knox is unique because it's on a military base. So our chapter, we have events for uh, our members. Um, they might be able to earn uh, uh, credits, uh, continuing education credits. We'll have topics. Uh, like SQL or cybersecurity. Um, we have Oracle coming to do a program uh, at, in a couple of weeks for our next for our next event. Um, but it's, it's just a good, we have speakers come in from all over talking about technology and how the government can benefit from different uses of technology. And it's not just like active duty, right? It's it's DOD, civilian personnel, kind of anyone in, the, in that space. Is that how it works? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, civilians, contractors, active military, uh, even people, if you're not on Fort Knox, you can still come to the events. I have people come down uh, from Louisville, actually, a lot of times. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously, uh, it sounds like you've got quite a diverse chapter. You were telling me about um, an award you guys are getting. Uh, congratulations. But that's coming Thank up at the, uh, uh, at the May event for, um, what is it, TechNet Cyber uh, in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So what, what was that award for exactly? So our chapter, the Fort Knox chapter, we're receiving uh, the diversity award. Uh, our chapter, our executive uh, board is very diverse. We have um, members who are still active in the military who serve in the chapter. Uh, we have women, we have men, we have um, different eth ethnicities and religions in our chapter retired veterans. So we're, we're a very diverse chapter. And so we're very excited to receive the award. So uh, tell me about your role as, uh, you know, heading up the, the women in FCA uh, program there. I mean, I know historically uh, the technology field, it seems to be a lot of guys and, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, at organizations like this, especially when you get the military involved, then um, that can be the case. But, uh, you know, what, what are some of the special initiatives that, uh, that you do to, to get women involved with FCA? So our women in FCS chapter, uh, we just try to get more women to come out and network with each other. Uh, you know, the, the, the base is huge. So a lot of people, we don't get to talk to each other a lot. And so we have these, uh, these networking events uh, for women, but men are also very welcome to attend. Uh, and we just come and talk about uh, women, in, women in technology and, you know, just kind of encourage each other and network. So I'm, I'm curious because we've, we've actually interviewed a few people over the last couple of years about women in tech or just diversity in general because there, there's certainly a problem in the private sector. And, and that's, that's the way that we normally approach it. We're talking about the Microsofts and Facebooks and, and so on where mm -hmm. they don't have great numbers. Uh, I hadn't really thought about the military. And I know historically the military is usually – pretty ahead on these things. The, the U.S. military at least desegregated before most states. So mm -hmm. in, in the world of government jobs, what, what level of disparity are we looking at right now? Is it, is it just you know, the same as what we're seeing in the private sector, or do you find there's a lot more women getting involved through the military? You know, to be honest, I, I really see, I, I don't want to say it's 50-50, but I think the military is doing a very good job in including women and minorities in these roles. Um, my team on my team specifically uh in my job uh, we're very diverse i would have to say there's actually more women on my team i have a team of developers and database administrators and project managers and most of my team i would say is predominantly female and what what kind of you mentioned a couple different areas there is there the one where you're seeing more interest than others like you know dbas or, or something of that nature Honestly, I would say it's it's very even <laughs> from from my standpoint. From what I'm seeing every day, I would say it's even. So, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, I know you you can't give away what you're uh, you're doing uh, at, at uh, the intricate level, but at high level, can you tell mm -hmm. us about what your role is uh, there at Fort Knox? As you're you're working with the Army, correct? Uh, correct. I work with uh, Army Human Resources Command, and my role there, I'm a quality assurance analyst. And to sum it up without saying too much, I basically uh, oversee the process of software development for um, a program that we're working on. Sneaky. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and anything else is on a need to know basis. And I don't need to know. Yeah, definitely. 
<laughs> we we did have a, you know a number of questions about like you know how many gold bars are in your office yeah. and other things like that. But we'll, we'll say that for another day. <laughs> Uh, I am curious, uh, you know, so the FC is very well established. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's chapters all over the, the U.S. I, it, it, I don't think extends outside of the U.S., right? Well, it's it just- does. I, I, I know that there's a lot of FC events that are um, in Europe and, think, and, and places where uh, there's a, an American military presence. So, you know, they'll have things in Germany, um, uh, Asia, and things like that. But uh, and, I, and I know, I've talked to some of the people at some of the shows that are actually from um, uh, allies, you know, from the German military or, or Canadians or people like that. So um, it, it does extend a little bit beyond okay. the borders. And, and Catherine, you're, you're focused on, uh, or at least one of your, your focuses is on the uh, women in FCA right there at the Knoxville chapter or Fort Knox chapter. Uh, are there, do you have counterparts at the other chapter locations? You know, or are there similar initiatives going on in other cities? Yes, uh, every month, once a month, uh, all the fem- all the women leaders from the different chapters, we have a call and we discuss what we're doing in our chapters. Um, we encourage each other to continue doing what we're doing in our chapters, and we always help each other out to plan events. So it's so it's so it's a network all around the world. When we have our calls, we have people calling in from England and um, just different places from all over. And how long have you been doing it for? I've been in this role for a little over a year. Um, currently, we are looking for someone else to take over. I kind of got into the role by accident, <laughs> and so I just ran with it. And so now I'm ready to pass the baton over to someone else. So in, in that year, uh, have you seen any significant change? It, it, it's kind of all gloom and doom in the news. You know, they they say like uh, <laughs> Apple put out terrible diversity numbers last year, and then Apple put out terrible diversity numbers this year. So you know, we're not really hearing a lot of progress on. But you're you're there at the front line. So what what does it look like for you? For FCA or just technology oh, you, you in just, general? Just like right there in your in your local area, are you finding that uh, you're You've got a a lot of women looking for jobs, and those jobs are available. Or are you finding that you're you're really having to work hard to get women into those positions? What what does that look like? Well, I'll speak on two different things. Uh, as far as getting women into technology, I think that there are a lot of women who want to go into technology, and the opportunities are there. Um, real quick, I wanted to mention a program called Code Louisville uh, that I participated in for a couple of years. It's a program that um, you know. Uh, helped people learn about development who wanted to get into the IT field. And the reason I got into the program was because I wanted to uh, understand more what my developers and database administrators, you know, what what they were working on. I wanted to go more into that because I'm more from the business side of IT, not so much the technical. So in that program, you know, I met a lot of women through that program. There were different women uh, networking events. So we're there, (laughs) we're here, and we're ready to work. Um, As far as the women in FCA chapter, I know when I took over as the women's VP of women's uh, outreach in Fort Knox, uh, they were having a hard time filling the position. And so that's when I stepped up. And now we have people wanting to do this position. So I think just being out there more and them seeing all the events that we have done uh, is, is really encouraging women to get more active. I, I think it's awesome to see resources like that that are out there. And, you know, we we do get people that reach out to us looking for you know, ways to get involved. And, and, you know, they might be in smaller cities where there is no chapter or there is no, no opportunity because you, you hear mm-hmm. about a lot of these really great opportunities, but they're only in San Francisco or, you know, in, in, in some of the larger markets. So it, I think it's great to see these kind of uh, spread all about. Now, I know primarily you guys are working with the armed forces. It's kind of the, the beginning of your name. Uh, but I imagine you're, you're interacting with the private sector a bit as well. Is that true or is it just strictly in public sector? Uh, we have, um, we have a lot of sponsors that, you know, they sponsor our events and, you know, they come to our events, they're seeing what we're doing and they're wanting to get more involved with our chapters. So it's not just on Fort Knox, uh, the community in the Fort Knox, Radcliffe, Elizabethtown area, they're getting involved with the chapter more. 
Yeah, we'll actually uh, be at the uh, TechNet Cyber event up in Baltimore, um, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a vendor that supports um, the armed armed forces. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that involved as well. So that, that's great to see. I wanted to ask um, a little bit about your personal journey. I'm always curious, um, you know, how people got into tech and how they got where they are. So uh, mm -hmm. you, you actually had a, a healthcare background to start, right? So how, how did you make that transition? Correct. So uh, the transition came, I uh, started working for a medical software company after I came out of managed care. I was working in, well, I started at the health department, then I went to a managed care organization, and then I went into a medical uh, software company, and that's where I got my start. And from there, it just took off. So did you kind of learn on the job then, or, or uh, did you have specific oh. IT training? or? Definitely learning on the job, um, having to pull, <laughs> having to pull reports out of databases, you know, I'd have to sit with people and they kind of walk me through the process. And so it was definitely a learning on the job type of thing, but it got me to where I am now. That's fantastic. So if, mm -hmm. uh, if people are interested in learning more about, uh, about FCA, maybe joining their local chapter, or if, if there are people that are uh, in that Fort Knox area that wanted to join up um, with, with your specific chapter, how, how would they go about doing that? Uh, if they're interested in joining the Fort Knox chapter, they can reach us on, uh, we have a Twitter account. We're on LinkedIn and Facebook under Fort Knox FCA Gold Vault chapter. And they can also visit our website at fortknoxfca.org. Sounds good. And the regular, uh, the, the national FCA is fca.org, correct? It is correct. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us today. And uh, it, hopefully uh, I can see you when we're up in Baltimore, maybe uh, grab a cup of coffee or something and say hi. <laughs> I will. I'll look for you. Thank you so yeah. much. And if you can just bring a gold bar or something, that would be um, fantastic. I will. I'll, 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 look. I'll, I'll pick about that cover up a tomorrow. coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll cover two venti coffees at Starbucks, <laughs> one gold bar. Yeah, all right. I think we could buy a Starbucks with that. <laughs> or, or the entire Starbucks. That's that's true. Well, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. And thank you, everyone, thank for you. watching. Yep, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for watching. But we'll be right back with more Technado right after this. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. IT directors often hoard so much knowledge that it's hard for their team members to learn. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide, this is important for me to learn. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. All right. Thank you to Catherine for joining us and congratulations on uh, those awards that she'll be getting uh, for their chapter, I guess, at the uh, at the FCA event coming up later this month uh, over in Baltimore. And, and that's really cool to hear um, the numbers she was saying when you when you talk about, uh, you know, diversity numbers um, for for gender in in tech in, in general uh you don't hear anything like 50 50 so that was pretty impressive to hear what they've got going on there yeah yeah you know it, i think that for a long time and i'm i'm making this up i don't have science behind it but uh for a long time uh tech wasn't necessarily an attack attractive career for a lot of women or that society was pushing them in a certain direction but i think we've reached that point now where pretty much everybody acknowledges that working in it is a pretty cool thing so uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of this stuff is going to balance itself out, but uh, it's certainly great to have groups like hers that are working to make sure we, we reach that equilibrium faster. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, we do have one more interview to bring you today, uh, and this one is uh, we're heading a little east now in, into Maryland. Uh, we're going to be talking with Todd Weller, who's the chief strategy offer, uh, officer at Bandora Cyber. And Bandora, they're actually one of the few people we haven't talked to before, but uh, but they're uh, like a threat intelligence. Yeah, threat kind intelligence of gateway. So you know they they create devices that uh, uh, basically monitor the traffic that's moving in and out of your network and rely upon uh, advanced threat intelligence or however many other marketing buzzwords I can throw oh, out. This is the week uh, to be playing buzzword bingo. Uh, it certainly is. It really is. But uh, you know, so they try to identify malicious traffic and block it before it actually gets into your network, which is incredibly valuable. Uh, especially for enterprises that have numerous locations, but even for small office and, and home office, uh, you know that that's a, a booming space. There's a lot of competitors, so we're going to talk to the the Bandura folks and kind of find out what 
sets their solution apart from everybody else. Yeah, it's a company that's growing, and, and they're right in the heart of that uh, that DoD, um, you know, military uh, area up there, uh, up near DC. So let's go ahead and talk to Todd and find out more about Pandora right here on TechNATO. Welcome back to TechNATO, and we are now joined by Todd Weller, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at Pandora Cyber. Todd, how are you doing today? Great. Glad to be here. Now, I didn't even ask you, where, where are you joining us from exactly? Um, actually, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. That seems to be the hotbed recently. It's the new the new Silicon Valley. I think it's all the the uh, three-letter agencies and, and all the tech people up there. But uh, So you're in, you're in the private sector, though. You're with Bandora Cyber. So I'm, I'm curious if you could tell the people that maybe aren't familiar um, with Bandora exactly uh, what it is you guys do. Yeah, so Bandura is a leading provider of a technology called Threat Intelligence Gateways. It's a solution that sits at the intersection of threat intelligence and network security. And fundamentally, what we do is we sit on the network and we filter inbound and outbound traffic based on large volumes of threat intelligence indicators. And so we'll partner with companies like Webroot, Symantec, Proofpoint. You know, we include a bunch of open source threat feeds. We'll integrate government feeds like the automated indicator sharing feed from DHS, their CISB feed, and we're also partnering with ISACs for specific industries to be able to bring that intelligence into it as well. Now, th- this is a relatively new organization, right? Or, or I know you've been going through some some growth and funding. Where, where do you stand with that right now? Yeah, so it's interesting. So Bandura Cyber as a company has been around for six years. Uh, I'm part of a new team that came on board at the beginning of last year. And the goal was really to uh, raise funding to accelerate sales and marketing. The company had done a really good job at amassing close to 100 customers and a strategic partnership with AIG. And, you know, uh, but, you know, lacked the capital. So we came on board and in the last eight months, raised $10 million from name brand investors like 10.4, GrowTech, and Gulatech Holdings. And we're taking that to accelerate sales and marketing. Now, I know that the, you know, the, the market for threat intelligence gateways has been really just exploding over the last year. Most companies have kind of reached the conclusion that we just can't, we can't count on our servers to be secure. And we can't count on traditional firewalls to filter traffic. So we need something more advanced. And that's kind of where the, the TIGs fit in. Uh, we've seen solutions from other companies that were either physical appliances or they were virtual machines for deployment in the cloud. What what does Bandura's technology look like? Yeah, so all of our secret sauce is in the software and you know the ability to ingest and filter traffic against over 100 million unique IP and domain indicators. Today, uh, customers have predominantly deployed that on a dedicated hardware appliance. It's commercial off the shelf. Uh, server equipment, but there is huge demand to run this in virtual environments. And so we're starting to see some demand to run our our TIG on VMware uh, as a virtual platform in the data center. And over the coming months, we'll be launching on AWS, Azure, as well as Google Cloud, because in this day and age, it really is a a hybrid environment. So you need that mix, but we can cover on-prem you know, virtual in a private data center as well as public cloud, you know, as we look out over the next few months. You know, personally, like, I I don't mind if something's just an appliance or if it's just a virtual machine, but I'll tell you, it's frustrating right now because a lot of, a lot of companies are going into these hyper-converged models where they have on-premises servers and then they have cloud servers also. And it's, it's always nice to have the same technology on both deployments, you know, that way you kind of manage it the same way. So in your environment, if we were to deploy it that way, you know, virtual machines up in the cloud, physical appliances on-prem, uh, is there like a, a centralized management for this or are each of the devices managed individually? No, you hit it on the head. I mean, centralized management is critical. Uh, and we have a you know, cloud-based, what we call our global management center, which you can manage multiple appliance deployments. And it doesn't matter if those are on-premise, you know, or or in the cloud, and 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 that's a key point. And um, you know, I think we've seen in network security over the last, I'd say, couple of years, a shift away from the native security tools that the cloud platforms provide because of just what you said. People are using multiple clouds; they want consistent security policy and management across those environments. 
Yeah, I, I know uh, Amazon last year launched their web application firewall. And when I first heard about it, I was like, wow, you know, Amazon's getting into that space. Maybe I can phase out a few other products until I actually used it. And it's like <laughs> so feature poor. <laughs> it's just not an effective tool uh, that you, you really do need something a little stronger to step in. And, uh, you know, on a side note, Peter, uh, you'll appreciate this. Uh, we just interviewed Threat Quotient uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. And I saw they're uh, listed as a partner. Yeah, Vendor is partnered with them. It, it, Todd, you mentioned that you can pull in threat feeds from a number of different vendors. Threat Quotient actually allows you to pull in even paid feeds. I mean, assuming you have a, a contract like with uh, Cisco Talos or whatever. Uh, so you'd be able to leverage that through Threat Quotient into Bandura. So again, kind of a, a unified deployment, which is, is something I know I'd appreciate. Yeah, it's a it's a small world for sure. Um, so I, I'm curious, what what uh, exactly does a chief strategy officer do on a, on a day-to-day basis? Where, where do you fit in there? Is it kind of like revenue growth and operations? You know, maybe you could tell me. <laughs> so it's interesting. So, I, you know, it's an interesting title. And I always say, you know, what does it mean? You know, we're about 30 people and I'm involved with everything from product management, uh, marketing, uh, strategic partnerships and alliances, uh, as well as getting involved with, you know, interacting with our customers and our channel partners. So so it's a wide ranging role at a company of our size. And, um, but it's, uh, stressful at times, but I tell you, it's a, it's a lot of fun to have, uh, such a wide swim lane, so to speak. So, so far, like what, what have you found is your, your biggest market? Like who's adopting this technology the fastest? Are you seeing a lot from the government side of things because of where you're located or is it private sector? Who, who's the, who, who's the most willing to engage in this type of technology? You know, it's, it's a great question. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's diverse. And, you know, my background is I spent most of my career as a Wall Street analyst. And usually you've seen with security technology companies and and technology companies in general, you're, you tend to either be large enterprise focused or better suited for small and mid-sized businesses. And, but, you know, we see, we see a variety. So we, you know, we have 200 customers, the majority of them today are small and mid-sized businesses that, are looking to you know deploy another layer of defense, get access to threat intelligence, maybe automate an ISAC threat feed. But we're also starting to see growing interest from larger enterprises that have a threat quotient, have an anomaly, they're tech threat intelligence power users. And the challenge they have is when they wanna be able to detect and block based on those indicators, they can't put them into their firewalls at the scale they want to. Uh, for performance reasons. And so uh, we we have a large energy company, a large healthcare company, both anomaly users, and both wanted to be able to detect and block. One used Palo Alto, the other Fortinet. They they just couldn't do it and decided to use the, the threat intelligence gateway to do that. You know, before the show, I looked over your appliances, and we've kind of gotten used to a lot of these solutions being tailored towards an enterprise, right? And so they're massive appliances, they're they're incredibly expensive, but they can handle huge amounts of data, and it kind of neglects that small office, home office, or even the the mid-sized company market. But you guys, you have appliances that, that run across, the, well, I mean, you mentioned virtual machines, they can scale to whatever, but, uh, but you have appliances that are specifically tailored to like a small office, home office, and are, are you... Are you seeing people more likely to deploy those today? Because it, it used to be where people would just worry about their data centers, but we see a lot of attacks come through those home environments. Is that what you guys are seeing? Yeah. So, you know, for our entry level, it's a 500 megabit appliance, and that'll go into small office environments, um, you know, more so than than data center environments. So, uh, you know, I think you're, you're hitting another great point, which is, you know, um, cyber attackers don't discriminate based on company size, right? And we know that small and mid-sized businesses are in the site. So they need the same kind of security capabilities that larger enterprises do. They just, they're significantly resource constrained. So so we see a lot of interest from small and mid-sized. And, and from that perspective, we feel like we're we're democratizing threat intelligence. It's, you know, no longer do you need to be the biggest company with a huge budget, an army of analysts and a SOC. Here's a kind of a turnkey form factor that's, also affordable because, you know, small and mid-sized are also more budget constrained as well. All right. Now, I know it's a, a very competitive market right now in you know, next generation firewalls and IPS and all these devices are kind of starting to overlap with what they they perform. So what is what is Bandura working on that's kind of, you know, setting you ahead of the competition or, you know, what, what's coming up in 2019 that's going to set you guys ahead? 
Yeah. So, so I think for us, it's, you know, number one, being focused on what we're really good at, right. Which is, you know, no matter whether you have our entry level appliance or our 10 gig, you can put, if you want over a hundred million plus unique IPs and domains and filter traffic against that. We often get asked a lot, well, why don't you go URL? Why don't you do deep packet inspection? Well, then, you know, we go away from what we're good at. The reason we can do so many indicators is because we're doing, you know, packet filtering, you know, and focused on that. And we'll let the firewall vendors, as you said, they do a great job at, at deep packet inspection. So for us, it's continuing to push the envelope as far as the volume of threat intelligence indicators we can filter against. It's continuing to add you know, additional threat intelligence sources, whether it's commercial or government. It's uh, integration and, and orchestration. And I know that's kind of a buzzword, but people want to do automation. And so our ability to integrate our TIG with a SIM or a threat intelligence platform to not only send logs and context for detection and monitoring and investigation, but also to enable an automated block. So we'll be looking to do that. And then, you know, pushing throughputs beyond 10 gig and, and cloud is huge for us. So I mentioned we're a 30 person company. That's a lot, right? So we're, you know, that we're, that we're executing on. Now, I know there's a, a huge push right now for more and more services to move to just end-to-end -end encryption or at least encrypting their, their data while it's in transit across the internet. So how, how has that affected you guys? You know, if, if, like HTTP, you know, that, that's easy to look at and inspect. At a minimum, you can see a source and destination, but you can actually see the commands that are being issued. But when everything gets encrypted, your appliances or, or really anybody who's trying to, to analyze the data is kind of at a handicap, right? So how have you guys been able to overcome that? So for us, we're actually in good shape, right? Because uh, we look pretty much at the IP or the domain. Right. Is it on or off a blacklist? Does it have a reputation score? And that aspect isn't being encrypted. Right. So where that challenge comes in when it gets into when you're doing deep packet inspection. Right. So if you're providing the intrusion prevention feature of a next generation firewall and it'll be interesting. Right. I think it's TLS 1.2. And there was a lot of controversy around that where it takes out the ability to do man in the middle. And the concern is it's going to render devices that do deep packet inspection blind. Now, you know, there's been a lot of investment dollars put into deep packet inspection. So I find it hard to believe that practically we're going to, uh, you know, we're, go we're going to eliminate their utility overnight. But, but it's a great question. But so far for us, it's actually a good thing because it really doesn't impact our ability to inspect. Awesome. And, you know, down the road, you can always leverage the uh, NSA's backdoor keys to uh, to be able to get at the data, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, especially you're, you're sure. close, so you can, I'm sure, just go knock on their door and, and they'll... Gladly share. Yeah, they'll share that <laughs> stuff. They're pretty forthcoming with that stuff. So, uh, Todd, if people want to find out more about Bandora Cyber, what's the best way for them to uh, to reach out to you guys? Yeah, you can check out our website, uh, www.bandorocyber.com. That must mean I'm old if I'm still saying www. So, but BanduraCyber.com, and you know we're on LinkedIn as, and, and Twitter as well. And um, but that's the best place to go. Yeah, that's what Don keeps telling me too. I say www still, and I think it's just a marketing yeah. thing was beaten into well, me. You know, from the networking side, uh, even if you don't say it, you still usually need it because of the way load balancers work. Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't well, work. Don always but, says <laughs> HTTPS colon slash slash. And I'm like, oh, this, this guy's secure. Uh, now, if somebody wants to try this out for themselves, do you guys have an evaluation or a, like a, a virtual machine they can deploy just to test it out? We do. We do. So we, you know, as a standard practice, uh, do no risk, no charge, no commitment, 30-day trials. Um, you know, whether that's a physical appliance we ship you out or um, whether it's a virtual appliance and you can do that uh, in line or as a lot of folks may want to do too, and that not to be disruptive, you could do it in monitor only or out of band as well. Awesome. Cool. And are you guys going to be at any trade shows coming up? Any any chance for people to like go and, and physically meet with you guys? Yeah. So we have a lot of events coming down the pike. More more than I can more than I can remember. Um, you know, we're doing some things with the Global Resilience Federation where we'll be we'll be out at um, a legal ISAO summit. Um, you know, we'll look to anomaly in the fall and we're at various shows ar around regionally. Um, and, and I'll be at black hat. So I'd love to, uh, 
Love to get some meetings at Black Hat, and uh, we'll also be at uh, Gartner uh, Security and Risk Management Summit in June. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to keep using different email addresses and signing up for that 30-day uh, get the uh, get the appliance in my house and secure my my network there. But uh, uh, thank you so much for for taking the time uh, to join us today. And definitely, like you said, um, you know, I'd recommend people head over to the website. You've got a lot of um, white papers and and things there, so um, stuff that can certainly uh, help people out. But uh, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Thanks, I enjoyed it. Have a great day. Yeah, and thank all of you for watching. But stay tuned. We've got more Technado coming up right after this. All right. Thank you to Todd for joining us and, uh, you know, for a, a chief strategy officer and not the, the chief security technology officer. officer. <laughs> security officer. He, 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 he stuck with you, Don. I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if he's doing the strategy, you got to yeah. figure out what's next. That He's a pretty involved person in that process. But uh, I, I always like it when you see more competition in that space because devices like theirs do a lot of stuff that is kind of black box where we can't we can't see what it's doing. We just have to trust that it does it. Uh, so the more competition in that space, the better, because you'll see who's more effective at, at protecting your network. Uh, devices like theirs are just becoming not really optional anymore. Like you've got to have something filtering traffic on your network. So it's, it's just neat to see another player out there in that space. Yeah, their website says they've got something like 50 patents uh, issued and, and pending. So there's definitely some sorcery and things that we don't know about um, going on in those boxes. So that, that's pretty cool to hear about. I uh, want to let you know about a couple of things coming up uh, from IT Pro TV. The next webinar we've got, um, what does hacking look like? That's going to be an exciting one. We actually uh, have had such a good demand for this one that we had to up the limit uh, of people on our webinar hosting plan. Um, so that that's a, <laughs> one of those good problems to have. Uh, that's because people want to know what hacking looks like. And we're going to watch a live network attack from both sides where Daniel uh, is going to be playing red team and, uh, and hacking into Don's blue team machine there. That's Thursday, May 9th, uh, 2 Eastern Time, U.S., uh, but you can go over to itpro.tv slash webinars um, to register for that, as well as the other webinars we have coming up. And you can also see the archive of all the past webinars that we've done there. But, Don, do you feel your system is secure and you're ready to hold off the attack from Daniel? Yeah, I, I certainly hope so, because, you know, the plan is that he's going to run through a full attack, and I'm I'm, I'm not going to stop him. I am going to talk about how I could stop him, but I, I need him to be able to move all the way through. So I'm going to be showing people how you can detect the attack, how you can see that it's happening to know to stop it. Uh, and if I don't detect one of his, then, uh, we got a then problem. that's a problem. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the, the key to this webinar is not to learn how to hack, but as someone that's monitoring a network, to understand what signals to look for to know um, when that kind of traffic is coming in so you can take the steps uh, to make sure you uh, combat it. So definitely a cool one, and we hope you can join us for that. Also want to let you know about an offer from IT Pro TV. If you head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado, uh, you can get a seven-day free trial to IT Pro TV and all of the great training that we have there, over uh, 4,000 hours of content and growing every day. Uh, you can use the promo code technado30, get 30% off your membership. Uh, also, you can find out about business plans plans and um, the pro portal and things like that that help uh, businesses uh, when they are using IT Pro TV to get the most bang for their buck when it comes to training. So that's go.itpro.tv slash technado. Check it out today. So that's a lot of interviews. We had a, a busy one here. It's been a busy one. And, uh, you know, normally we try and hold it to about one interview a week, but some of these were pretty timely like Perdeo, so we needed to get that one through. Uh, but we are always looking for more people to interview. So if you know somebody or you yourself might be a great guest here on Technado, please reach out to us. You can shoot us an email. The best place to email for that would be interviews at technado.com, right? Or .com. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I know we wanted to get technado, but yeah, yeah. we couldn't convince everyone else that that was a, a sound investment in the... Dothraki? Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic, that's right. <laughs> Dothraki. I, I couldn't remember yes. what the deal was, but I still think we should do it. I, maybe we'll start a GoFundMe. Yeah. And see if see if our fan is interested in, in doing that. So. If we can get uh, Jason Momoa to oh, handle our registration. Is he, is he Dominican? <laughs> 
Uh, no, he was the Dothraki Aquaman? guy. Oh, I okay. forget. He was Aquaman. <laughs> he, yeah. I, I, I don't know why. I just said Dothraki, but all I could think of was, why would Aquaman help us <laughs> with that? All right. Because he helps people. That's, that's what he true, does. And he talks true. to fish. Right, that's my mistake. Fishing attempts. And, See, it all ties back. And Dominican's an island. It's surrounded by big yes. water. Absolutely. See? So, Unraveled the mystery. Yeah, figured it all out. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining <laughs> us. And, and tune in next week for sure. We're going to have some more great interviews. Uh, and Justin will be back. Probably. Yeah, and Jason Momoa, possibly. So yeah. stay tuned to find out if that happens. And we'll play some buzzword bingo next time when Justin's back as well. Uh, he's the reigning champ, so we want to make sure he was here for mm. that. So make sure to tune in next week. But for now, thanks for watching. We'll see you then.